we're, we're into the heart of winter now and felt like winter a few days this week. And, uh, but that's good. That's good. I have a friend who has come to work with me here from California. And uh, Friday, we were working on a project and uh, he was talking about how cold it was. And I said, yes, I said, um, in Ohio, we are blessed with four distinct seasons. And we really are, we're blessed with four distinct seasons. I said, the problem is sometimes we'll experience all four of them on the same day. And that can happen. So, because he was commenting that just a few days ago it was 68 degrees and then it was you know, wind chills below zero. So anyway, but it's all good. If you have your bulletins, look, there's announcements here. Um, tonight, there's a board meeting at seven o'clock. If you're on the board, you know who you are. Uh, board meeting at seven o'clock tonight. Um, at the annex would be my guess. That's where we've been having them. We can social distance there. So board meeting seven o'clock tonight, January 22nd. I'm not sure what day of the week that is. Saturday, January 22nd, 2 p.m. to 5 p.m., a celebration for Jim Porter. Um, many of you know Jim. I knew Jim. Super nice man. At the Port William Senior Citizen Center, is hosted by Diana and John Porter, Jim's brother. So if you knew Jim, please uh, plan on stopping in January 22nd, 2 to 5 p.m. Any, oh, another announcement here, CMEA meeting at the Mount Olive Church of Christ, which is in New Vienna, it's a nice church there. CMEA meeting at the Mount Olive Church of Christ, New Vienna, January 18th, 6.30 p.m. Let Brent know. Usually there's carpooling that goes. I, I have to be honest, I've not been to a CMEA -E -E meeting, okay? Um, but Rick and Gary especially, I think, are very faithful about going. I think the food usually is excellent, and I'm not sure if that has something to do with it, but it doesn't hurt. Is that right, Rick? Yeah. Doesn't hurt anything. Okay, so there's a meal involved and fellowship and, and um, Christian Men's Evangelistic Association meeting January the 18th, 630 Mount Olive, Church of Christ, New Vienna. Any other announcements? Yes, Jody. We have a ladies' aid meeting Tuesday at 6.30. Ladies' aid meeting Tuesday at 6.30 at the Annex Fellowship Hall across the street, and all ladies are invited. No men. Okay. If you're a man, you want to go, they'll take your money. No. No, ladies' aid meeting. Tuesday, uh, 6.30 at the Fellowship Hall, across the street. Any other announcements? Micah, Joshua, you guys have anything? No, you're, you're good. Very good. All right. So, that's our announcements. We're here to rejoice and to, to praise the Lord. For our scripture reading this morning, it's one of my favorite passages in Jeremiah, chapter 17, starting in verse 7, and this is just... An expansion of Psalm 1, if you remember uh, a, a comparative verse of, of Psalm 1, this is an expansion of Psalm 1, it says this, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, and whose hope is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river, and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green. And will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. You know, we're not promised an easy road. We're not promised that there'll never be times of drought, that there'll be times of difficulty. But we are promised that if we put our hope in him, that we shall be like that tree that always continues to thrive and to flourish.
time through the chorus. Um, every week we get to gather around and take the Lord's Supper and just uh, it's 
the chance for to remember what he did for us, the uh, the bread representing his body that was pierced for us, and his uh, the blood or the juice representing the blood that he shed. Um, and we get to remember that um, even though we fail every week, um, that because of that sacrifice, uh, we still have the opportunity to uh, become a new creation. And, um, but I, I think also uh, this, this time is a good time to just uh, reflect that because of what, what that happened, um, or because of Jesus' sacrifice, that we also have a duty to um, live for him and spread uh, the gospel. Um, Matthew chapter 5, 13 through 16 says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So I think we can just uh, take a time to uh, think about how we can uh, be the light of the world in the upcoming week. Um, let us pray. Dear God, thank you for allowing us to be here and partake of the Lord's Supper and worship you and um, learn about you. God, I just ask that you would take this time to um, call us to remember uh, the sacrifice that Jesus made for us and um, so we don't take it for granted. And um, I just ask that you would help us to better um, live out the life that you've called us to live. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. The uh, elementary kids can be dismissed to go downstairs with Roger, and uh, we're going to talk <clears throat> this morning, we're going to start a series of uh, messages on what it means to be untangled. Uh, if you're like me, part of adult life is sometimes untangling things. Uh, I haven't taken my Christmas lights down, I'm a little bit behind, but I think about uh, when I put them up, how they're first given to me. And I said, Jamie, where are the lights? And Jamie says, 
here are the lights that you are need to put out on the front porch. And they look something like Clark Griswold's uh, lights on Christmas vacation. And so I'm sitting there, this task that I don't particularly enjoy to begin with, putting up Christmas lights, it starts with this total pain of untangling. It makes things complicated and unpleasant. Uh, the second uh, the way that I thought about Tangled is a little bit out of my depth. Uh, this past Monday, uh, Jamie was still fe feeling very bad, so the kids and I went to Walmart to, for a list of supplies, and we, all, we always do, do you need anything? Jamie said, yes, get me conditioner. And so Lena is with me, and we're walking down the conditioner aisle, and uh, I said, Lena, why is it that we use more conditioner uh, when we're when we, uh, faster than shampoo? We buy the equal size bottles, you know what I'm saying? So in my male mind, like these things should be going down at the same time. And at the same time you buy a conditioner, you're buying shampoo, right? Make sense? She said, Daddy, I don't, want get my, I don't want my hair to get tangled, so I get the conditioner. I get four or five pumps every time. I said, oh, you're the reason. And like as a, a guy, we can never probably appreciate, like if once your hair gets tangled, right, it's painful to get it out. Brushing, weeping, gnashing of teeth. So it's one of the things. The other thing that I think is <clears throat> when I take the boys fishing, we have a pile of five fishing rods sitting there in my garage. And uh, they're not always that bad, but they've all been woven together. And so before I even start, what I have to do is separate and untangle five fishing rods. It's unpleasant. It takes work. But you got to do it if you want things to work the way that they're intended to. So the question then becomes, are there times in my life where things get tangled? And for most everyone, the answer is yes. And in the a book of Hebrews chapter 12, the author writes about, all right, if, if we want to live a certain way, achieve a certain goal, then we need to get untangle ourselves from the things we find ourselves in. So we're in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And it begins this way. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, the previous chapter is the faith hall of fame. So the idea is Noah, Adam, Abraham, they can all observe our faith on some level. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. What do we do instead? And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And so the picture here that he is painting of, of the Christian life is someone running in a race and not a sprint, but this endurance event where, uh, where you are uh, just need a complete freedom of movement to have this beautiful stride that you can maintain and actually win. And so the, the, he paints this, uh, the, the Christian life in this awesome way. And so for the first question, we're going to ask ourselves a series of questions today. The first question we're going to ask is, do I want the fullest and best Christian life possible? Do I want to bear as much of the fruit of the Spirit as I can? Do I want to know God? Do I want to grow to become like Jesus? Do I want to be able to serve him to the high, most that I possibly can? And if the answer is yes, then all the things that get us tangled up, uh, we need to remove from our lives. What we also have to acknowledge is there are some that will look at that question and say, um, the fullest and best Christian life possible, do I want that? And their answer is actually no. I just want to do enough to go to heaven, right? It's sort of the D is for diploma of spirituality. What's just enough to get by, and that's what I want to do. But this sermon series is for those who say, yeah, I want the fullest and best Christian life possible. And if the answer is yes, it becomes an issue of how do we sort of untangle ourselves from the fun, uh, things we find ourselves in. It's all about maximizing uh, the experience. And... Uh, the author of Hebrews is painting a picture of uh, endurance, sports, and racing. 
Now, if you go into Xenia to the uh, Xenia station where all the bicycle places go to, together, you'll see lots of people riding bicycles. This area of the state and of the country, we love to ride bicycles, and it's great. I have a bicycle. And I've always thought, like, when the memo was passed out, which said whether you're riding a recumbent bike or you're riding a carbon fiber framed race bike, whether you're just leisurely pedaling down the trails of the uh, Green County Parks and Rec, or if you are in the Tour de France, no matter what, you must wear tights, right? You know what I'm talking about? And you like you must wear the jersey. And every time I see that, and I've ridden bikes hundreds, if not thousands of miles, every time I see that, I'm like, is that really necessary? I mean, how many minutes or seconds are you saving in time riding your bike that you've traded your dignity for that? I mean, is this really necessary? And these are things that are going through my head. And of course, when I see a stranger on the street, do I ask them, was this worth it to you? I can't ask them that. However, I do know a group of ministers in, in Southwest Ohio that uh, starting at Labor Day, every year they ride their bikes from Cincinnati to Cleveland. And one of them I know pretty well, his name's Hannah Taylor. Uh, we are interact on a lot of different levels uh, for different things. And I said, Hannah, did you go on the bike trip this year with Jim Bush? He said, yes, I did. I said, Hannah, did you, do, you, do you guys all wear tights when you do it? He said, yes, we do. I said, is it really necessary? He said, yeah, it kind of is. And while I may not feel comfortable with it, and you'll never catch me, never in a million years, catch me out there, ride my bike like that, what you have to appreciate is the mentality that they have. Whatever it takes to make this experience the best that, we will, that it can be, we will do it. And so uh, in the Christian life, it'll be like whatever it is that's loading me down and tying me up, if, if, if it means me to running this race uh, gracefully and with strength and with endurance, I'm going to get that thing out of my life now. I'm like, I'm willing to do whatever it takes. And so what are these things uh, that we need to chuck out to live the best Christian life? Uh, the first thing is uh, anxiety and worry, which are really the same thing uh, if you look at it from a biblical point of view. And we realize this is something that affects a lot of different people. Uh, it's, uh, statistics say that uh, 7% of children ages 3 to 17 experience issues with anxiety each year. That, that statistic is off because the youngest kids, Generation Z, one of the defining marks of their generation is that they experience anxiety on unprecedented levels. Over 40 million adults, one in five Americans, uh, have been diagnosed with a di uh, an anxiety disorder. And this is just the tip of the iceberg in that those are people who are willing, uh, whose experience with stress and anxiety is so acute that they are discussing it with their doctor. What that is not counting is all those people who are keeping it stuffed inside and I would, who say to themselves, I would never dream of telling my doctor or anyone else how much the things going on in my life stressing me out are causing worry and anxiety in my life. So it's real. And we realize that we all have stressors in our life that can lead to anxiety and worry. Uh, you probably know exactly what they are for you. And it can be helpful to sort of cue that up as we work through it. What are these things that uh, I worry about? Not the things that I'm concerned about, but what are these things that come in waves in my mind constantly? There's a sense in which our stress is objective, meaning that some people have more stressful situations in their lives than others. In fact, there's a chart where you can add up, if you're going through this, it's this many points. If it's this, it's this many points. And if you've reached uh, uh, something over 70, uh, you are really, really stressed out and need to watch it. And so there's objectively, some people are less stressed than others. Uh, last month, we bought a dog, Skip. And I drove up to Sugar Creek, Ohio, and I bought Skip. And he, he was uh, born and bred on an Amish farm in Sugar Creek, Ohio. And I said to the breeder, Mr. Schlebaugh, I said, uh, so do you farm as well as race dogs? 
He said, no, I just raised dogs. And I'm driving back, I'm thinking about Mr. the rest of Mr. Slayball's day. How stressful can it be? He must be playing with puppies all day. I mean, how hard can that be? So some people have more stressful lives than others, but the other fact of the matter is, uh, whatever the most stressful thing in your life will seem stressful to you from your perspective. And so as we think about this, we won't really want to define uh, anxiety and worry. And in the Bible, the words are in the same family, so they're synonymous. But um, in the Merriam-Weston Dictionary, anxiety is fear or nervousness about what might happen. And worry is mental distress or agitation resulting from concern, usually of something uh, impending or anticipated. And here's, if you look closely at that definition, uh, there's this theme uh, of, of worry and anxiety that it's not focused on what has already happened. It's not focused on what is happening. It's not focused on what will definitely happen. It is focused on what might happen. What might happen. And when we let this sort of thing, what might happen, consume us, first of all, it um, really overestimates our ability to predict the future. Today is the last regular season game day of the NFL season. Now, if I told you <clears throat> back in September, the Browns and the Bengals are playing, are ending the season in a meaningless game, you said, well, the Browns are coming off a playoff run. They improved their defense. They have the coach of the year. And the Bengals, their quarterback is coming off knee surgery, their offensive line is in shambles, and uh, their coach is on the hot seat likely to get fired. So given those circumstances, the team in first place three months ago, you said, would have been who? Browns, not the Bengals. But guess what? You were wrong, right? Some of you are very happy about that, right? My pain is your pleasure. All right, it's fine. Uh, go back 12 years ago, 2014. If I said to you, now this is not political commentary here, this is just uh, talking about our ability to see the future. If I told you in 2012, just, I just mentioned it because it's 10 years ago. If I said uh, in 2016, Donald Day Trump will be the President of the United States. If I had predicted that four years before it actually happened, what would you have said to me? You're crazy. And if someone had said to me, I'm like, the guy on the Celebrity Apprentice is going to be running our country? It's like, well, yeah. So, like, we can't predict what the future is going to hold. And so the thing about it is, if, I'm, if, if my worry and anxiety is focused not on what definitely will be, which we don't know a lot of, but what might be, then I probably wasted a lot of time and emotional energy worrying about things that might never happen. There's a Scottish uh, proverb... Uh, that says what may be, may not be. And so one of the reasons we want to get rid of anxiety and worry is because they take a toll on us as people. Take a toll on your body. Uh, I'm going to read this very quickly, but listen to all the different uh, symptoms related to stress and worry and anxiety. Difficulty swallowing. Dizziness, dry mouth, fast heartbeat, fatigue, headaches, inability to concentrate, irritability, muscle aches, muscle tension, nausea, nervous energy, rapid breathing, shortness of breath, sweating, trembling and twitching. Uh, and then you go into like a more systemic level, suppression of the immune system, digestive disorders, muscle tension, short-term memory loss, and premature coronary artery disease and a heart attack. Proverbs 12, 25 says, anxiety in a man's heart weighs it down. It's bad for us. Uh, the actual definition in the Old English death. And so what the, the, so that means that uh, if we are dealing with undue amounts of worry and anxiety, it is that is something that is shaking us. 
and throwing us off uh, our equilibrium. And so we, as we think about what the Bible says about it, we need to consider how do people deal with worry. As we sort of process this, we want to do run it through the first question is, um, can I actually do anything about what is worrying me? Is the solution within my control? I can't control the rate of inflation, can you? No. I can't control the price of milk, and neither can you. But if they're saying things and I'm sitting there and I'm like, I'm concerned about this. In fact, it's causing me to be worried, but I can do something. First of all, uh, we should do it. But then the, with the things that we can't control or do anything about, there's the issue of uh, how, how do we handle it. Some of the ways that people typically handle it is just to deny it. Oh, I'm fine. I'm good. We compartmentalize it. The second approach is to turn to a coping mechanism or a form of self-medication. Some examples of this are spending compulsively. The American consumer uh, economy is built on the idea that if you buy this thing that they're selling you, it'll make you happy, make all your problems go away. Uh, another example is, uh, that, that researchers give is drinking too much caffeine, watching endless hours of TV. And sometimes these can be ends of the spectrum which show our, our sort of self-medicating ways to deal with our, our stress, withdrawing from friends or partners, or conversely, jumping into a frenzied social life to avoid social problems, overeating or weight gain, undereating or weight loss, sleeping too much, drinking too much, lashing out at others in an emotionally and physically violent way, taking up smoking or smoking more than usual, taking uh, various prescription over-the-counter drugs as a form of relief. And the reason that I list those uh, is if we do one or more of those things, we should consider why. Is this, way, is this a way that I am dealing with my stress? Uh, part, of, part of dealing with anxiety and worry in a biblical way is making sure our thinking is pretty clear about things. Often we'll have to rewire how we think about certain things. That's maybe the biggest thing to do. And so if we're starting with some real fuzzy thinking, we have to kind of see how we're truly thinking about things. Because um, very few of us uh, have the self-awareness to say, um, I've uh, sat down after work and watched TV for six hours straight. Is that my way of checking out of life? Uh, I know a lot of people um, that eat to deal with their stress. And uh, I don't think most of us sit down who do it say, you know what? I'm really stressed out and worried, so I'm going to sit down and eat an entire pizza uh, to make me feel better for 15 minutes. I don't think we think about it that way. That doesn't mean that's not the reason that we're doing it that way. So we need to be aware. Uh, the third, besides denying it and coping with it, is, is treating it as a medical issue, which it is in that it, uh, brain chemistry is affected. And I think one of the good things about uh, mental health right now that's emerging is uh, that some of the stigma of being anxious or being a warrior is starting to disappear, and that allows people to really be open enough to deal with it. I have a friend who uh, I went to college with, and he's a very uh, successful minister at a large church in Virginia. And last year, uh, he had a panic attack before church and went to his office and, like, shut down. And he posted that on Facebook that afternoon. And 10 years ago, 15 years ago, he would have been fearing for his job. Like, these people are going to get rid of me because I can't get it together. But now, um, 
we're realizing, hey, this is something that people deal with, a lot of people deal with. My concern about it as a pastor, though, is like if I isolate it and say anxiety and worry are simply medical issues, then we take everything the Bible says about it and we throw it out. So my role is not to say, hey, you should do have this conversation or that conversation with your doctor. It's to say, uh, if we are experiencing anxiety and worry, if we are, it's going to have us tangled up. And I'm not going to be able to live the best Christian life I can. But what does the Bible say about it? 1 Peter 5, 7 says, uh, cast all your anxiety on him. So that cast is a picture of just throwing it to God. Because he cares for you. Now, I don't want to be simplistic and trite and even a little churchy and say, hey, how do we deal with stress? We just uh, give it to God. I don't think that will help, really help anyone. Um, unless we're a little bit more specific. What I want to focus on over the next several minutes is, well, why would I cast all my anxiety on him? Well, because he cares for me. And so if I have uh, sort of the thoughts, we have a phrase in my family, when someone's thinking about the same stressful thing over and over again, and you can just see the wheels in their brain turning. Have you ever been around a person like that? We call that stewing. Like you're just sitting there stewing about something. All right, so if you're sitting there stewing about something and you uh, are thinking about the same things over and over again and you're playing out different scenarios and often we're playing out the worst case scenarios, uh, what we need to do is start to rewire how we think and what needs to be included of that train of thought is the truth that the reason that I can give my anxiety to God is because he cares for me. And so maybe if I'm sitting there uh, dealing with that, laying awake at night, or however we deal with anxiety is worry, maybe I just need to say out loud to myself, God cares for me. In this scenario that is going on, no matter what might happen or might not happen, God cares for me. The way we talk to ourselves is perfect, it is, uh, is important. And so something like a simple thing, God cares for me might be a, a, a way to do it. I read a story. That sort of illustrates this. There was a, uh, a minister that was on this long flight. And it was not one of those smooth flights. The sign on the airport, airplane flashed, fasten your seatbelts. Then after a while, a calm voice said, we will not be serving the beverages at this time because we're expecting a little bit of turbulence. Please be sure your seatbelt is fastened. Have any of you been in an airplane that's experienced a bunch of turbulence? I've, never, I've just done a little, and it's like, oh, I've been in a, in a lightning storm circling Chicago until the plane landed. That's the extent of it. This is a true story. Little turbulence, don't get your beverage. Okay, you buckle it up. And, uh, you, you know, you hear that, and uh, you look around the aircraft, and the, and the minister there was, it was obvious that many of the passengers were a little bit nervous about that announcement. And then a little bit later, the voice of the announcer said, we are so sorry that we are unable to serve the meal at this time. The turbulence is still ahead of us. And so then the storm broke, and there's these cracks of thunder that could be heard above the roar of the engines. And lightning is lighting up the sky as it flashes. And pretty soon, uh, the, the way that this, the... Uh, the airplane is hitting pockets of air. It would rise up on this gust of wind, and then that wind would disappear, and it would drop down, rise up, gust, and gust down. You can imagine how much discomfort and fear those are around. And, and the, the pastor says, as I looked around the plane, I could see that nearly all the passengers were upset and alarmed. Some were praying. The future seemed ominous, and many were wondering if they would make it through the storm. And then he saw this little girl. And it seemed like that storm meant nothing to her. She tucked her feet beneath her as she sat on the seat. She was reading a book, and everything within her small world was calm and orderly. 
Sometimes she closed her eyes and then she would read again. Then she would straighten her legs, but worry and fear were not in her world. And when the plane rose, despite being beat by the winds of the terrible storm, and when it lurched this way and that, as it rose and fell with frightening severity, when all the adults were scared half to death, this child was completely composed and calm. This guy on the plane could hardly believe what he was observing. The plane finally reached its destination, and all the passengers were hurrying to disembark. And that pastor lingered to speak with the little girl he had watched for such a long time on the plane. He said, you know, you were so calm and composed on the plane. Why were you not afraid? And the child replied, because my daddy is the pilot, and he's taking me home. So she was saying, I know the person in control, and I trust him. We can frame our worrisome situations with this. God loves me and is in control. He cares for me. Uh, in Matthew 6, verses 25 through 34, uh, they're not on the screen, and I wasn't sure we'd have time to read them this morning. It, uh, it talks about, Jesus talks about uh, worry. He says, you should not worry. He says, uh, your father knows what you need. Is one of his main points. And as we're rewiring our thinking about it, we say, well, yeah, yeah God, not God not only cares for me, he knows what I need. He said, uh, you should look at the birds of the air. They're not stocking up. They don't have a barn, but they eat. Look at the flowers. There's nothing more beautiful th than them, and you're much more valuable to God than those things. So he will take care of you. The other thing that Jesus says is, uh, and which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his life? A single hour. I'm 41 years old. How many, about how many hours does a person live in 41 years, do you think? Guess, anyone? It's hard to do the math in your head, all right? It's 359,000 hours. Some of you are a little bit older than me too, right? Some of you have gone past the half a million mark long ago. Some of you are closer to one million than half a million. I did the math uh, yesterday, and I was like, 359,000 hours. That means, uh, so my worrying, I can't add a single hour to my life. So can I save myself 1% of my life through my worrying? No. That'd be almost a year. Can I save myself 1% of 1%? My math is not good, but I think that's still like 359 hours. I, may, I can't even save myself 1% of 1% of 1%. And so Jesus is saying, uh, not only does God know everything you need, not only does he care for you, not only will he care for you, but this worrying thing you're doing is just, it's a waste, so you should stop. In Philippians 2, 5 through 7, Paul says, the Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. So we've talked about rewiring how we thought. The other thing that Paul tells, you, tells us to do when we deal with worry is this. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Oh. So what he's saying that we should do is pray. I, I don't know uh, how you pray. Uh, or how you deal with worry and anxiety. 
I know how I, how I do. And so what I think Paul is telling us, besides our need to rewire how we think, it always weigh when we have a concerning situation that God loves us, knows us, cares for us, and that worrying won't do any good is, is we need to say, you know what, if I have thought about this situation a thousand times, um, I may need to pray about it how many times? Maybe a thousand. Maybe every time that I have the situation, I realize this is beyond my control. I don't know what's going to happen. I am going to pray and hand this to God. I wish I had a silver bullet that was like, hey, take these three steps that are quick and easy and you can do by tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock and all your anxiety will go away. It's quick. It's simple. It's easy. Everyone's going to be living a stress-free life when we get back here tomorrow at uh, the next week at, at, at Sunday at 1030. I would love if it was, but it's not that easy. I have to know, I have to remember, God cares for me. God knows what I need. He takes care of things much less valuable than me, so he's going to care for me. So whatever this is, is concerning me, I can just kind of hand it over to him. And if it keeps coming back with thoughts into my mind, I just need to pray every time it does. Here's the fact of the matter. Jesus was willing to die on the cross for our sins to take care of our eternity and our guilt. And anyone who loves us enough to take care of that big thing will take care of the small things in our lives as well. If you've not accepted his grace, we're going to offer an invitation right now. We accept God's grace, and we need it because we're sinners who, apart from God, would deal with the eternal consequences of our sins. We accept that through faith in Jesus Christ, through confessing him as Lord, and through repentance and baptism into his one, becoming one with his death, burial, and resurrection in baptism. So let's stand and sing an invitation to him. And if you have that decision to make, come forward at any point while we sing.
several uh, prayer requests added in the morning. This morning, uh, Jenna Kuhn, who grew up in the church, her mother-in-law, Cindy, is in the hospital and was non-responsive this morning, but her vitals are good. And then uh, Rosemary Rittenhouse is asked for prayer for David Matson, uh, who had a stroke. So uh, appreciate prayers for David. Uh, let's close in prayer. Dear Father, we thank you so much for today. Uh, we thank you for how much you love us and uh, how well you provide for all our needs. And I just pray that as, uh, in our battle of the mind, when worry and anxiety enter in, that we would not forget that. And instead, we'd turn to you. I pray for those who are uh, struggling with illness right now of various kinds uh, and that you would heal them and give them strength uh, through your spirit, and that uh, they'd receive comfort from your presence. We thank you for your son. It's his name I pray. Amen.